Hello, I'm Deb Friedman, and I'd like to thank you for joining me as we look at the life and career of Judge James Wickersham. We're going to look briefly at his background and early days in Illinois, then look more closely at his turbulent times in Tacoma. And finally, we'll follow his career in Alaska. This is possible thanks to incredible resources provided online by the Alaska State Library, nearly 40 years of transcribed personal diaries. But before we begin, I'd like to answer questions, why Wickersham and why me? As many of you know, after I retired from Tacoma Public Library, I spent more than a decade volunteering for Tacoma Historical Society. I was able to do what I loved, researching, writing through books and exhibits, and always learning more about Tacoma's history. My early work focused on Tacoma's forgotten Jewish pioneers. I was mortified to learn that two of the anti-Chinese agitators were Jewish, and I had to look closely at Tacoma's 1885 mob violence. Then two years ago, I was expanding and updating a database of Tacoma photographers, begun by the late Dr. Carolyn Galachi. I noticed the names C.E. and Hattie King. I was intrigued that Tacoma had a professional female photographer in the early 1880s, and I tried to learn everything I could about her. And then I realized her husband was the first man on the left in this picture. It was taken by the Jackson Studio, and copies were sold as souvenirs to raise funds to defend the indicted men. To me, that begged the question, what about Hattie? Why didn't she take the photo? Then last fall, I was working on Tacoma's banks and bankers. That brought in two more men from the group, and I realized I had created detailed biographical files on five of these indicted men. So I considered that at some point, I might want to just dig into every one of them, partly to get a sense of what were they thinking, and partly to have the satisfaction of seeing them all die off. The Bank on Tacoma exhibit opened the first week in March of 2020, and a week later, COVID hit. The museum closed, and I suddenly had time for a new project. So I spent four months doing pretty intense biographical research on nearly 50 agitators. Some were on numbered committees, some were said to have worked secretly, some spoke loudly at public rallies, and some dropped out when push came to shove. My goal was to have my research concluded and written up by November. And then came Wickersham. I had saved him to the end, partly because I was working alphabetically and partly because I knew he had quite a story. So my process was the same as with the others. I initially ignored public sources. I did my own research, starting with Tacoma's 1885 and 1887 census records. I never intended to spend months actually reading his diaries. I thought I could just skim through looking for mentions of Tacoma and verifying details. But I admit, I got hooked. At first, by his story. Will he win this close election? Will he profit from his mining shares? And then by historical events he mentioned, the San Francisco earthquake, the sinking of the Titanic, the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby. But most of all, I was caught up in the strength of his personality. There were times when I talked to the computer screen telling him to just, just give up already. So today, I'm going to share with you what I've learned about Judge James Wickersham. If only so I can get back to work on finishing the rest of my project. And using our 2020 hindsight, I'll ask you to join me in judging the judge. Wickersham was born on August 24th, and often mentioned in his diaries that 24 was his lucky number. He grew up on a farm near the town of Patoka, and when he was 12, his father built a lumber mill in town. Wickersham remembered driving a mule team pulling logs, and he was particularly fond of the call of the redbirds that kept him company. Although he didn't attend college, he was able to study law in Springfield with former Governor John Palmer. One source notes that he did odd jobs for Palmer, earning $5 per month and access to Palmer's law library. 
There he met Deborah Bell, who was often friends with the Palmer children and often visited while attending high school in Springfield. Perhaps through her family's connections, Wickersham taught school in her hometown of Barry for a year and boarded with her family. He proposed on the day she graduated from high school, which was also the day her father died, leaving her an orphan. She accepted. He was admitted to the Illinois Bar in the spring of 1880, but supplemented his income by working on the 1880 census. Through that work, he became fascinated with, of all things, card filing systems and learned to keep meticulous records. All census workers do, right? When the couple's first child was born in 1882, they named him Daryl Palmer Wickersham, honoring Wickersham's mentor. Likely an even greater influence during his six years in Springfield was a very long shadow of Abraham Lincoln. Wickersham spoke of working with lawyers who had known Lincoln personally and of seeing Mrs. Lincoln visiting shops in Springfield with her son. He was aware that he walked the same streets where Lincoln had walked, and he became a lifelong Republican, except when he was at war with them. Well, Wickersham and his extended family moved to Tacoma in June of 1883. One of my personal pet peeves are the pioneer biographies that make it sound like these men came west all by themselves. Wickersham's entire extended family relocated to Washington. His parents, his siblings, aunts and uncles on both sides, even some of Debbie's siblings. His parents platted the town of Buckley and several of his siblings later joined him in Alaska. His relationship with all of them was stormy at times, although he was particularly close to his youngest sister, Jenny, who really was just a bit older than his son, Daryl. So how does a young lawyer still in his 20s make a start for himself in rough and tumble Tacoma? He transfers his Masonic membership, serves as an officer of the local Republican club, and runs for public office. He must have made quite an impression because he was elected probate judge in 1884 after just a year in Tacoma. And he was elected for a second term in 1886 even though two Republicans ran against him. That election was dominated by the candidate's participation in Tacoma's 1885 Chinese expulsion. For this discussion, I want to start with one aspect of that movement, the role of the media. Today we have radio, television, internet, and multiple social media platforms, all with diverse viewpoints. In Tacoma in 1885, there were two daily newspapers, The Ledger in the morning, backed by the Republicans, and The Democratic News in the afternoon. Kind of like when I was a kid, we had two television channels. The Ledger was published by Randolph Radabaugh and H.C. Patrick, who played a leading role in the agitation. In June, The Ledger printed a special anti-Chinese supplement and sponsored a mass meeting. But when things got too hot at The Ledger, Patrick split with Radabaugh. He bought an interest in the news, along with other anti-Chinese agitators, including Wickersham. Wickersham risked losing advertisers if he didn't keep supporting the movement, so the result was that both daily newspapers in Tacoma were regularly printing racist anti-Chinese filth. And Wickersham and Radabaugh became enemies. That would be a pattern throughout Wickersham's life. So here's a simple timeline of some of the events of 1885. A regional meeting at the end of September set very specific deadlines for intimidating Chinese workers to leave by terminating their jobs. The turning point came on October 8th, when Tacoma's Chamber of Commerce passed a resolution in favor of removing the Chinese. And on November 3rd, what was supposed to be taking a census of remaining Chinese workers turned into a mob that helped them pack and forced them out of town. Over the next few days, their homes mysteriously caught fire and burned. By now, this story has been told many times, and it should be quite familiar to most of you. 
What I'd like to point out, though, is that in 1885, the entire population of Tacoma was less than 7,000 people. There were fewer than 10,000 people in all of Pierce County, and it's estimated that about 1,000 of those were Chinese, with perhaps 700 living in the city. So through intimidation and eventual mob violence, 10% of Tacoma's Chinese population, 10% of Tacoma's population was forced out. 10%. So what were the repercussions? Well, Portland was outraged and the Oregonian called for an immediate investigation. Enter General John Sprague, who had played a part in bringing Chinese workers to Tacoma for the Northern Pacific Railroad construction. Sprague was also the first mayor of United City of Tacoma. Remember that his choice not to run again in 1884 was what opened the door for Weisbach's election. When investigators came in, Sprague named names. 28 indictments came within a week for conspiracy to incite riot. 27 men were arrested and taken to Vancouver. And in this photo, Wickersham is fifth from the right, holding a satchel above the number 10. The men posted bail and were back home in a matter of days, treated to a victory celebration dinner. So here's another souvenir photo. This one of the committee of 15, proud of their leadership roles. Wickersham is in the center with his hands strategically posed. Debbie gave birth to their second son in February of 1886. So she was about five months pregnant at the time of the expulsion. A month later, the indicted men won a change of venue from Vancouver to Tacoma because it would be cheaper and the indictments were suddenly set aside on a technicality. However, a month before the 1886 fall elections, a second indictment was brought against 10 of the leaders in what we now call an October surprise. On November 3rd, Wickersham was the first speaker at the celebration of the first anniversary of the expulsion. He actually gave an I had a dream speech, picturing a Tacoma, where no Chinese were wanted. He was pretty upset that he had not been nominated for re-election by the Republican Party. So he accused them of the worst thing he could think of, being pro-Chinese. Wickersham was re-elected, but he had to run as an independent. And in March of 1887, the second indictments were dropped. Why? Because Washington was gradually chipping away at women's suffrage rights and four women had served on the grand jury that brought the charges. Case closed. But Wickersham tempted fate again. In the fall of 1887, he allegedly began an affair, taking out of town buggy trips with a teenager named Sadie Brantner. When his toddler son, Arthur died in the spring of 1888, Wickersham was not at home and his wife, Debbie, was alone at her son's deathbed. About the same time, young Sadie became with child and had what was then a criminal operation in May that nearly caused her death. Panicked, Wickersham's friends took her to a boarding house in Seattle run by the WCTU, similar to Tacoma's White Shield home. There, she recovered and was pressured to reveal the name of the man who had caused her ruin. Wickersham was arrested in September for seduction, which ended his chances for a third term. Radabaugh's ledger had a field day with a sensational story. Wickersham retaliated by suing Radabaugh for libel, asking $50,000 in damages. If I understand it correctly, during the week-long trial, Wickersham never denied the affair. Instead, his defense involved bringing in witnesses to question the girl's integrity. In February of 1889, Wickersham was found guilty. Immediately after the verdict was announced, he was again arrested for inducing witnesses to perjury. Throughout his career, these charges repeatedly came back to haunt him. Yet in his diaries, 
he consistently referred to what he called the woman troubles as blackmail. <clears throat> so what does a lawyer do when he's in serious legal trouble? He hires a bigger lawyer. Wickersham brought in John Palmer Jr., son of his mentor and former Illinois Governor Palmer. Two weeks after Palmer's arrival, Sadie was spirited away from her Seattle boarding house and persuaded to recant her statement. Sadie signed an affidavit that she had lost her virtue before her affair with Wickersham, so he technically wasn't guilty of seduction. Palmer also obtained a change of venue, moving the case to Judge Frank Allen's court in Tacoma. Judge Allen granted a new trial, and then both charges were dropped. Again, case closed. While he was in Tacoma, the younger Palmer also went into business with Wickersham, forming the Illinois Investment Company. Together, they started a town near Hood Canal that they named Allen, expressing their gratitude to the judge, who was now openly their business partner. Now, today to get to Allen, most people drive through Gig Harbor and around Key Peninsula. It's about an hour's drive. But in the 1880s, there was a daily steamer with connections to Tacoma. Debbie's brother-in-law was a forest ranger in Mason County. Wickersham recognized those timber opportunities and established a lumber mill, just as his father had done in Patoka. Well, in addition to the town of Allen, the Illinois Investment Company platted the town of Springfield, named for their hometown, but on the tip of Henderson Bay. Although it never developed into a city, the area today is known as Wana, just across a spit of land from Purdy. Well, imagine my excitement. I'm at home for months on end doing this research, and I realized that Wickersham's project was where I turn at the end of my road. And just as Washington Territory was achieving statehood, Wickersham and Palmer were forming railway and navigation companies. They were intent on creating a transportation network around Port Angeles. If you think about it, during Wickersham's first decade in Tacoma, in Washington, he lived through a pretty crazy period. He maybe cast his vote in the election that brought the merger of old Tacoma and new Tacoma. He might have helped fire, fight the fires on Pacific Avenue. He would have joined in the big July 4th celebration with the completion of the switchback. And as an attorney, he would have closely watched the transition from territory to statehood. And like everyone else, he joined in the building boom of the 1890s. And what I personally think was the greatest miracle of all, he also joined in the population boom. His wife gave birth to their son, Howard, in October of 1893. To me, that implies that she chose to forgive him. But 1893 brought a financial panic and a recession that hit Tacoma particularly hard. It likely brought the end to Wickersham's career as a developer. He needed income, and some of the few paying jobs left at the time were in government. So realizing that after the scandal, he likely couldn't get elected for office on his own, Wickersham worked to get his friend Edward Orr elected as Tacoma's mayor in April of 1894. At the time, each mayor appointed his own police and fire chief, city attorney, and treasurer. And Orr immediately appointed Wickersham as his city attorney. But the council refused to confirm him. They eventually conceded, if only to keep the city functioning. Those of you who have been following our banking exhibit know that the city was bankrupt. The transition between city treasures was a mess, and both treasurers, Boggs and Macaulay, would eventually go to prison at Walla Walla. The office of city attorney was vital. And yes, the city of Tacoma was over $5 million in debt. Now, a good chunk of that was the recent purchase of the Light and Water Company, started by Charles Wright. That's why today we have Tacoma Public Utilities. But in hindsight, during the Depression, the cost seemed like an inflated price. And so, as city attorney, Wickersham sued Wright for a million dollars in damages. 
alleging fraud and misrepresentation. When the case finally went to a jury, they worked into the night on New Year's Eve, returning a verdict at 2 a.m. on January 1st, 1896. Wickersham won his case for the city. And the following week, the city council quietly confirmed his nomination by a vote of 11 to three. His career and his reputation were back. He was now the victor in the famous million dollar lawsuit. In reflection, his work as city attorney was perhaps as impactful in Tacoma's history as his role in the Chinese expulsion. That summer, he returned to private practice. In hindsight, that was a stroke of genius. Winning a judgment is one thing, but collecting it is something else. The city hired Wickersham's law firm to work as an outside contractor to collect the judgment against Charles Wright, a process that took years. In the meantime, Charles Wright died and the city eventually reached a compromise with his estate. But the work netted Wickersham's law firm $25 thousand dollars. If he'd still been city attorney, he wouldn't have profited at all. Well, what did he do with his earnings? With some of it, he bought a new house, even though he'd live in it for less than a year. These photos were taken in 1899, when his youngest son Howard was about six years old. Wickersham later complained that he paid ten thousand dollars for it and then couldn't sell it for a third of that. He still owned it at the time of his death, but it was vacant through much of the depression. You'll also see that he had started collecting baskets made by indigenous people. And he began documenting their language and place names. He published an article about the true name of the mountain and we'll come back to that. And as much as I'd really like to hate the guy, in December of 1893, he spoke out in writing against a Tacoma school exhibit that was going to the Pedagogic Institute in Philadelphia. Specifically, he objected to the inclusion of a photo of Chief Seattle intended, and I quote, to furnish a contrast between the ignorance of the former inhabitants of Puget Sound and the intelligence of the present inhabitants, end quote. To his credit, Wickersham held that Chief Seattle did not come of an ignorant stock. And finally, while he was city attorney, Wickersham wrote an open letter in support of Indian fishing rights based on the treaties of the 1850s, just as Judge Bolt would do 75 years later. Well, by, 18, or by 1898, Wickersham had burned quite a few bridges in Tacoma, so he took on Olympia. He successfully ran for the Washington House of Representatives and began his term in January of 1899. At the time, the state senators were elected by members of the House, not by popular vote. So one of his first acts was to nominate Addison G. Foster for senator, earning the senator's gratitude in return. So now, as Wickersham's political career is taking off, you'll see that I've added a bar at the bottom indicating presidential succession, which now becomes a factor. I also found it interesting that at the end of February, the House adopted Wickersham's motion that members in future will not be permitted to explain their vote during a roll call. I can't imagine what that would have been like. In January of 1900, Wickersham started a daily diary. I think maybe he was impressed by the change of century, just as we were 20 years ago with Y2K. We learned that he had used his influence with Senator Cushman to get a Naval Academy appointment for his son, Darrell, and Wickersham couldn't help gloating at the death of Theo Hosmer, brother-in-law of Charles Wright. He described Hosmer as broken in fortunes, a man who had often and loudly threatened to run me out of town. Wickersham also started gathering letters of endorsements because he expected a federal appointment. It came in June through Senator Foster and President McKinley. On the 17th anniversary of his arrival in Tacoma, Wickersham took the oath of office as judge of U.S. District Court in the 3rd Judicial District of Alaska. He would work from the fledgling town of Eagle rather than the larger Juneau or Nome, 
and he would become a really big fish in a really widespread pond. <clears throat> I'd like to take a minute here to point out the incredible work of the Alaska Digital Archives. Wickersham's diaries are available in several formats. First, they're transcribed in a daily chart form as a, you can download the PDF. Second, the early volumes are available as a JPEG image of each page, but there's a date bar on the right so you can scroll through page by page. And finally, each of those early volumes has a transcription of the text below the actual image. It's a really incredible resource. And I hope you are thinking how we might do something similar here in Tacoma. Wickersham was smart enough to take to Alaska with him a Kodak camera. You'll see that in Eagle City, he lived in a small rustic cabin with his wife and son. What you don't see is a kitchen. They took their meals at a restaurant nearby. And you also don't see a bathroom or indoor plumbing. That meant trips to an outhouse in winter in Alaska. Well, Wickersham immediately jumped into his work. He arrived in July and opened court in August. He also immediately fell in love with Alaska, the majesty of the mountains, the open spaces, and the incredible wildlife that clearly was there for him to hunt and kill. He arrived in Alaska really at the prime of his life in good physical condition. He often hopped off the dog sled and hiked ahead. He also was aware that he was making part of Alaska's young history in this time of gold rush, noting in his diary when he sent the first telegram or some other first. Well, Debbie and his son Howard were with him for his first entire year, much to his delight. I think it's likely that Howard's birthday present that fall was the dog they named Yukon. <clears throat> in July of 1901, Debbie and Howard left to spend a few months in Seattle. Not unusual for Alaska folks. But now it seems particularly poignant to read Wickersham's thoughts as they left, because it would be the last time he would see his son alive. Debbie and Howard both caught typhoid, which settled in their lungs. Both were diagnosed with consumption and then tuberculosis. They were unable to relearn, return to Alaska that fall. And Wickersham wrote that he resigned himself to a lonely winter. But Howard died in January of 1902, and Debbie buried a second son alone. Wickersham didn't learn of his son's death until March, when he finally received a telegram from his clerk. Now, reading between the lines, I couldn't help noticing that Debbie didn't send the telegraph. In January, she sent him a letter that said she was going to be with Daryl in Annapolis until spring. Wickersham didn't receive that letter until April. And since we're judging a man by his own words, his comments in his diary were about his own grief with no mention of Debbie's. Well, Debbie did come back to Alaska in June of 1902 and she stayed with him for two summer months, but in August returned to Seattle and then went south for the winter. For the rest of her life, more than 20 years, Debbie lived out of a trunk, usually visiting Alaska for a few months in the summer. She never again lived year round in her own home, even though the couple still owned a house in Tacoma. Even when they were in Washington, DC, they stayed in an apartment above a congressional dining hall. Debbie needed a corner air, a corner room, so she could get air. Wickersham later noted that she had been an invalid since 1901 and that Howard's death was really the end of his home life. Yet he never once spoke of leaving Alaska for a warmer climate. Wickersham today would be called a workaholic. During 1903, he held court during the day and in his solitary evenings, he worked on compiling a book of Alaska laws, going back to 1868. He also started organizing and editing annual reports of judicial decisions, his own and from Alaska's two other judges. At the time, Fairbanks, which he had just named, was starting to boom 
He personally drew plans for a courthouse and jail, hoping it would become an American Dawson. And yes, he profited when the courthouse was built on lots that he happened to have available. Wickersham had lived in Tacoma in 1890 when George Francis Train set out to travel the world in 60 days in what we would now call a publicity stunt. Well, Wickersham did something similar in May of 1903, attempting the first recorded climb of what was then Mount McKinley. He paid the group's expenses, hoping to profit from later publicity and keeping the rights to their photos. He also arranged for printing of a few issues of what he grandly named the Fairbanks Miner, charging $5 for each souvenir copy. Wickersham relied heavily on the navigational help of two local Indians, to use his term, with Christian names of Abram and Simon. He carefully noted that their word for the mountain was Dinali, as in father. Abram also warned mountain sheep fall off that mountain, and guess white man no stick em. He was right. Wickersham's group gave up their attempt at 10,000 feet and turned back on June 21st due to the high risk of slides at a cliff now called the Wickersham Wall. It would be 10 years before another team successfully made the climb, picking their way along the ice. In early 1904, Wickersham spent a few months on the East Coast. He attended Darrell's graduation from Annapolis and poked around Washington, D.C. He wasn't getting rich as a judge and was aware that his term would expire in June. He was able to meet personally with President Roosevelt and noted that he also helped Senator Cushman rewrite some Alaska bills. He returned to Alaska in March and in June opened the new courthouse in Fairbanks before it had doors or windows. On the left is a photo of Wickersham at his desk and in the center is a photo of a museum display recreating that space. Wickersham helpfully appointed his old Tacoma friend, African-American John Kana, as his courthouse janitor. Later, he hired Kana to cook for him when Debbie was gone and to keep the house warm. Yes, he treated Kana with respect, but as a hired servant, not as an equal. He did build a home in Fairbanks, and after a few years, he even added a heating system, trying to entice Debbie to stay longer. It's now open to the public as a museum known as Wickersham House, complete with historic reenactors. But I wonder how those folks handle the years from 1904 to 1907, when Wickersham was repeatedly under congressional investigation. Although he was reappointed by President Roosevelt, Congress refused to confirm his appointment. Sound familiar? Turns out he'd made a few enemies in Alaska. Complaints came into DC about everything from his court rulings to his personal mining interests and properties to his earlier scandals in Tacoma. In fact, the late Tacoma historian, Dr. Ron Magden, felt that novelist James Missioner used Wickersham as the inspiration for his crooked Alaska judge character. It makes me wonder what dealings Wickersham didn't record in his diaries. Yet he refused to rent his properties to saloons, frequently condemned women who were working as prostitutes, and immediately fired an employee if he found them drunk. He had learned not to trust. Wickersham went back to DC in 1906 to try to clear his name and stayed for six months, testifying before committees and lining up votes. Finally, in June, President Roosevelt took him aside and sent him home to do his job. Wickersham noted that Roosevelt personally promised him another two years and eight months, the length of Roosevelt's remaining term. But more investigations followed. And in the fall of 1907, Wickersham resigned his position as judge. He felt strongly that the personal attacks were damaging the dignity of the court. And of course, he hoped that private practice would be more lucrative. He lasted all of six months. He was admitted to the Alaska bar on January 6, 1908. And on June 22nd, declared his candidacy for Congress. 
He felt that the people of Alaska should choose their leaders, not men in D.C., and he would work for that for the rest of his career. Around this time, Wickersham started pasting newspaper clippings into his diaries, so over the years they also became scrapbooks, making them even more valuable for researchers. Well, Wickersham won the election in August of 1908, and again in 1910. Curiously, his opponent in that election was his former friend and Tacoma mayor, Edward Orr. By the way, Wickersham felt that the Seattle 1909 Alaska Yukon Expo was an insult. You know, the one where we put, you'll like Tacoma in giant letters on Lake Washington. In his words, the U.S. appropriates a million for an Alaskan fair and invites us to come see it. On top of that, there was a last minute switch in the date of the Alaska census, moving it up three months when many people had gone out to see the expo. Well, his role in DC was unusual because at the time, Alaska's congressional delegate could introduce bills and make speeches, but couldn't vote. For Wickersham, that meant he could devote all of his time to promoting legislation to improve Alaska without having to be present to vote on anybody else's issues. He felt strongly that Alaska was ready to be governed as a territory, but President Taft was vehemently opposed. In January of 1910 alone, Wickersham made more political enemies than many politicians do in a lifetime, directly opposing the efforts of the Secretary of Interior, the Secretary of War, and President Taft. By March, he realized that the cost of fighting Taft's coal leasing plan, but he didn't back down. It probably struck him uh, pretty close to home when Taft declared that Alaska was where people went to hide from their past. In February of 1911, Wickersham's diary entry began, this has been a day of battle. He had been in the middle of a speech in the house when he heard Frank Mondale call him a liar from just a few feet away. In the heat of the moment, Wickersham went for Mondale's throat, noting in his diary that when a man calls another a liar without smiling, it means a blow. Well, after the mix up, as he called it, he regained his composure, apologized to the house and went on speaking. He noted that the bill was defeated 151 to 32 as he had hoped. Well, I admit, I didn't know much about this decade, and it was fascinating seeing a bit of it through his eyes. While Wickersham was in DC, he slipped over one day to the Supreme Court and listened in when the ruling came to dissolve Standard Oil as a monopoly. And for those of you who truly love politics, I suggest that you look at his diary covering June of 1912 as he describes personally participating in the Republican National Convention in Chicago. He arrived late and was told his credentials weren't in order and he wasn't allowed to vote. He finally got a ticket to watch, just as Taft was nominated over Roosevelt by just 22 votes. If he'd have gotten in, it would have been 21. He then joined the Roosevelt delegates across town at Orchestra Hall as they held an insurgent convention and nominated Roosevelt at what was the birth of the Progressive Party, nicknamed Bull Moose. Wickersham called it the spectacle of a lifetime. He was reelected in 1912 and 1914, although he had to switch parties and even create parties to do it. He didn't even go back to campaign, just sent back copies of his speeches and accomplishments. In 1914, he sent a record by speaking for five and a half hours on the floor of the Senate. He wrote that the next day he was worn out physically, but felt like a woman who has had a baby, very proud, but damn sore. However, he was most proud that on his 55th birthday, a reluctant President Taft signed into law his Alaska Home Rule Bill, creating an Alaska legislature. The election in the fall of 1916 was a different story. It was a near tie, and the results went back and forth. In early January, Wickersham was ahead by only 
11 votes and was certified as the winner by 26 votes at the end of February. His opponent, Democrat George Seltzer, contested the results and the election was reversed in April of 1917. Seltzer was sworn in, but Wickersham refused to leave, stayed in his DC office and opened a house investigation. It took him a year and a half, but the decision was again reversed and Wickersham officially held the office again during January and February of 1919. Now keep in mind that by that time, there had already been another election in November of 1918, since the terms were just two years. And that election was also a near tie. Seltzer was initially considered the winner. He was sworn in and served six weeks before he dropped dead on April 15th. It'll come as no surprise that Wickersham was also contesting those results and didn't even run in a special election to replace Seltzer. Running unopposed, George Grigsby was sworn in as delegate in July of 1919. And again, a year and a half later, Wickersham was able to get the decision reversed and served one week at the end of his two-year term. Now, I admit I was relieved when I read that his friend was stepping in and that Wickersham would not run again in 1920. So two questions come to mind. How and why did Wickersham work so hard to get the decisions reversed? Well, as to how, he personally went back to Alaska and took depositions from voters, asking them to state who they had voted for, then ask key questions about how long they'd been a resident. Did they live in a reservation? Were they soldiers? Or where was their permanent residence? In that way, he came up with hundreds of specific votes that he felt were cast illegally. And then he worked his way through House committees and subcommittees until he could get into a House vote. It didn't help his timeline that the nation had entered a world war and President Wilson had higher priorities. But why? Well, of course, partly as a matter of principle, no question. But at the end of each term after his victory, Wickersham received his full two-year $20,000 salary plus $5,000 for his clerk plus was reimbursed for expenses. His opponent was also paid for the full term. And in the definition of the word chutzpah, Wickersham complained that his taxes were higher because his salary came as a lump sum payment. Oh, and by the way, see that photo at the top of the page? It's from the Wikipedia entry about Grigsby, but I'm pretty certain it's Wickersham. Kind of an ironic twist, don't you think? Well, and I wanna mention one more thing before we leave DC. Remember when I said that Wickersham had written about the true name of the mountain? In May of 1917, <clears throat> he testified before the Geographic Place Names Board and his 1893 pamphlet was introduced as evidence. It was at the peak of Sam Wall's campaign for justice for the mountain. But Sam Wall had also worked with Radabaugh in Tacoma in the 1880s and wasn't exactly a friend. Wickersham called the process a monkey and parrot time. I can't help but think that maybe today we'd be calling it Mount Tacoma if he had fought for the name of the mountain as hard as he had fought for his own reelection. Well, Wickersham kept writing and publishing. He eventually completed eight volumes of Alaska reports, compiling every single legal decision and creating a law library for Alaska. But his legacy was truly his personal library. He had already been collecting books about Washington, which were stored for him at the Washington State Historical Society in Tacoma. Well, then he started collecting every book and pamphlet he could find about Alaska. And he used his card system to create a detailed bibliography of every book ever written about Alaska. While he was in DC, he had the luxury of hiring staff from the Library of Congress to work with him in the evenings. And when the Alaska Bibliography was eventually published in 1927, it contained over 10,000 entries.
He also worked throughout his life to write and rewrite and rewrite his memoirs. Like many authors, he garnished a pile of rejection letters. Many publishers told him that stories about Alaska didn't have any lasting interest. He'd be tickled to know that an illustrated version was reprinted in 2009. So what was life like for Wickersham now in his 60s? He returned to Alaska, but moved from Fairbanks to Juneau, which came as a surprise to Debbie. That's likely when he ended an affair with a woman in Fairbanks. He simply noted that a man must be discreet, even in his diary. But he did name her name when they bumped into each other on a boat and both headed in opposite directions in an awkward moment. On his 64th birthday in 1921, he summed up kind of an inventory of his financial position. $33,000 in cash and bonds, property in Buckley, Tacoma, and Olympia, three houses in Alaska, several mining and property claims, plus his personal library. Was he thinking about retirement? No way. Well, one project that sparked his interest was preserving a totem pole that featured Abraham Lincoln at the top. And I encourage you to read more about that online. He kept his foot in the political door. One event that I really noticed was in the summer of 1923, President Harding made a whirlwind tour of Alaska. When the president's entourage stopped in Juneau, the president's secretary pulled Wickersham aside and said that the president was considering a plan to create a state out of the southern third of Alaska. Could Wickersham put together some facts and figures? So Wickersham blew off every presidential reception and event and spent the entire day in his office compiling projected statistics of land size, population, and natural resources. When Harding left Juneau that evening, his secretary had Wickersham's completed portfolio in hand. Unfortunately, President Harding suddenly died less than a month later. And to add insult to injury, in order to accommodate Harding's visit, Wickersham had chosen to decline an opportunity to see his son Darrow in Seattle and to meet Darrow's new bride. Wickersham also started going pretty regularly to the movies. He marveled as technology improved and actors appeared to speak. His particular pet peeve was films that were supposedly set in Alaska with false scenery and weak plots. He felt strongly that more fur coats were worn in the streets of California than in Alaska. And we have to keep in mind that in Tacoma at that time, H.C. Weaver's movie studio was filming Eyes of the Totem, using Mount Rainier as a snowy backdrop. Well, Wickersham stayed busy practicing law and meddling in local politics. He preferred civil cases over criminal and traveled all over Alaska to try cases. When his mother had several strokes in 1924, he intended to go see her, but was busy and stayed for another case, and as many do, instead he went for her funeral. Meanwhile, Debbie's health had again declined. She had a diagnosis of tuberculosis in her good lung and a cancer scare that turned out to be colitis and gallbladder trouble. She spent most of her time in California with Daryl and his wife, Jane. When Debbie was hospitalized in the spring of 1926, Wickersham wrote, I'll go down myself as soon as I find a good place in business affairs. He didn't. Instead, Debbie came back to Washington that summer and stayed in Enumclaw with his sister, Jenny. He visited for a few weeks in August, but stayed in Seattle doing business before returning to Alaska for the fall campaign. After the election, Wickersham returned to Seattle on November 13th, and Debbie died on the 23rd. When he returned to Alaska, he said, I shall make Alaska my home until my days are ended. A year later, he was back for his sister's funeral. Then he wrote, Mother, Debbie, and now Jenny. I am indeed an old and lonely man. He didn't stay lonely. In June of 1928, he married Grace Vrooman Bishop in a ceremony at her childhood home near Des Moines. To be honest, she was a good match for him. 
She'd been a close friend of Debbie's and was a former school teacher in Everett. She had come to Juneau in 1910 when she married her first husband, Harold Bishop, who died in 1920. She was also a hard worker, a skilled bridge player, and a good hostess and cook. He noted in his diary that perhaps the way to a man's heart was through his stomach. And Grace often read aloud to him due to his failing eyesight. After seven years of living in a hotel in June, in after living of a hotel in Juno, Wickersham bought a house. He paid six thousand dollars cash for it, plus spent nearly four thousand dollars more on renovations. He had lumber and siding shipped from Seattle, and they combined two rooms on the second floor for his precious library. Grace already owned an apartment building in Juneau and later converted the third floor of the house to an apartment for rental income. The couple moved in just before Herbert Hoover was elected president. And finally, he could enjoy a home-cooked meal and then take guests to his library for cigars. Throughout his career, Wickersham often helped startup companies prepare for their incorporation papers. And he would do that in exchange for a few shares of stock. He often made additional investments. But no matter how hard he tried, throughout his life, Wickersham somehow never invested in a business scheme that made him rich. He never got a really lucrative retainer position and he never grub staked a mining claim that paid out. He really only had that one big paying case in Tacoma. But he also never stopped trying. In the spring of 1929, Wickersham chewed on the idea that Alaska's indigenous people had never signed a treaty with the US government. Their land had just been purchased along with the deal with Russia. He proposed pushing for legislation to allow them to sue for compensation. He worked with the Alaska Native Brotherhood through Billy Paul, who I think here is identified in the bottom as Paul William, to get a contract with the Alaska Native Brotherhood to represent them as their attorney for 15%, of course. But he lost that chance because he took another. In January 1930, he announced his candidacy to run again for delegate against his former opponent, George Grigsby. The incumbent, his friend Sutherland, was stepping back. And after all, Grace had never been on the East Coast. But this time, Wickersham began by letting President Hoover know that he would totally support his administration. He easily won the primary, and he actually worked during the fall to unify Alaska's Republican Party. And he won the November election by 290 votes. You'll note that he had his photo taken in profile as he is now blind in his right eye. He was a much different man when he came to DC this time, now in his 70s. First, he, took, he went there by a leisurely train trip in February of 1931 with Grace. They traveled down the Pacific coast to visit his son, Daryl, then family in Alaska or in Texas, through New Orleans and up the east coast to DC. He had to hire Grace as his assistant due to his vision loss and Will Steele was his secretary. Now, Will had the great idea to start sending weekly letters to Alaska newspapers about their work. And Wickersham, for once, had sense enough not to interfere. For once, he was working with the press. <clears throat> he and Grace took long rides around the city and attended presidential receptions and events, although he refused to attend an event at Statuary Hall in June to dedicate a statue of the Confederate Jefferson Davis. In his diary, he wrote, prejudice of my early days kept me away. I cannot forget the boys of 1862 who were killed in the war. The following week, he wrote a letter to Irving Berlin, suggesting an Alaska song similar to Sidewalks of New York. Well, that summer, he took the unusual step of trusting his daily diary entries to Grace while he underwent prostate surgery and had two large tumors removed. And in the fall, just days before the death of Thomas Edison, he told his friends in Alaska that he would run for re-election in 1932. And this time, no Republicans ran against him. On January 4th, 1932, Wickersham wrote, my real work in Congress has now begun. 
he closely aligned with President Hoover and enjoyed White House events. Grace also had an active social life. As part of the women's branch of the American Legion, she attended a ceremony at Arlington Cemetery to plant a tree honoring the mother of the unknown soldier. His only mention of the growing poverty around him was to complain about, to complain about the hundreds of hungry, tired, and ragged war veterans now coming in, as he said, to force Congress to pass a bonus law. In June, he and Grace traveled by private sleeper car back to campaign in Alaska, and they stopped along the way to listen to the Chicago convention proceedings on the radio. It would be a very different campaign. When Wickersham came back to Alaska, when Wickersham first came to Alaska, he traveled by steamboat and then by dog sled. It took weeks just to get from place to place. He worked hard during his career to get funding for an improved railroad network, but I don't think he ever drove a car. He mentioned that when he came to Seattle, someone would pick him up in an automobile. And when his son, Darrell, bought a 1929 Packard and took him on a trip to the, around the Olympic Peninsula, Wickersham wrote that he was exhausted from traveling at 40 miles an hour. Yet in the summer of 1932, when he arrived in Alaska to campaign, Wickersham learned that his opponent, Tony Diamond, was traveling all over Alaska by private airplane and making campaign speeches on the radio. And yes, I checked. Alaska Airlines was started in 1932. Wickersham tried doing a few radio spots on his own, pointing out that his opponent's airplane cost $100 a day, and it was paid for by big interests. But he could only personally visit a few targeted places in Tacoma, lagging behind his opponent in more ways than one. He also split with Billy Paul, losing his connection for Native American support and finally complained in his diary, he actually wrote, the Indian vote won't stay bought. In the end, it really didn't matter because as he wrote on November 9th, licked to a frazzle, the whole Republican ticket goes down covered by a Democratic landslide. <clears throat> Wickersham wouldn't live to see another Republican president. He returned to private law practice Wickersham looked forward to Saturday meetings of the Juno Bar Association, although he often noted that the food was better than the conversation. His former adversary, college president Charles Brunel, arranged for Grace to serve as regent at the Alaska Agricultural College and School of Mines, and for Wickersham to receive an honorary doctorate in 1935, just before the name was changed to the University of Alaska. The photo at the bottom left shows Grace seated on the governor's right at the name change with Wickersham standing behind her. <clears throat> but finally, at long last, he found a publisher for his memoir, Old Yukon. He spent a very happy year promoting his book and welcoming visitors who knocked on his door asking for his autograph. And he even learned, earned a little money from the $4 cover price which he needed because as Wickersham turned 80, he ran out of money. He lost vision in his good eye and couldn't read or work. He had tenants for several of his properties, but they were unable to pay him much rent and he certainly couldn't sell the properties for their former value. In the spring of 1939, he found a buyer in Seattle for the part of his beloved library covering Washington and Oregon. The sale would bring him $2,200. He shipped the books to the buyer who died the following month without paying. Wickersham couldn't even afford the cost of shipping them back to Alaska. So Grace's niece displayed them at a Frederick and Nelson store without success. As you can see here on July 21, he wrote, we need money very badly. Our taxes are due. I'm blind. Our creditors are threatening to cut off our lights. I can't see to practice law if I had business which I can't do. In August, he listened to Hitler's speech on the radio. And in September, he heard England's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain declare war. It's no surprise that Wickersham's blood pressure skyrocketed. <clears throat> His last diary entry read, just a shadow 
cannot see, blind. He suffered a stroke on Thursday night, October 19th, and died on Tuesday morning, October 24th. This time, 24 was not his lucky number. After a quick service in Juneau, his body was shipped to Washington for burial with Debbie and their two sons at Tacoma Cemetery. He left most of his estate to Grace, including his library, which she was able to sell to the territory of Alaska in 1941. <clears throat> After Grace's death in 1963, her niece Ruth inherited their Juno home and opened it to visitors. The state of Alaska bought it in 1984, and now the House of Wickersham is operated as a historic site by Alaska State Parks, in addition to the Wickersham House in Fairbanks. And so here, straight from the Alaska State Parks website, is a summary of Wickersham's legislative accomplishments during his seven terms as delegate. <clears throat> it's clear that in Alaska, he is remembered proudly. He devoted his career to fighting for Alaska. But what of his earlier decades in Tacoma? Historian Heather Cox Richardson recently wrote that if we're going to get an accurate picture of how a society works, historians must examine it honestly. That means seeing the bad as well as the good, because after all, any human society is going to have both. But as society changes, the qualities we care about shift. So yes, we are judging a man who was born more than 150 years ago. His actions against the Chinese that brought him temporary acclaim in Tacoma in 1885 are clearly unacceptable by today's standards, just as they should have been then. Today, we recognize him as a racist and an adulterer. Yet Wickersham left a legacy in Alaska through his library and legislative work. Perhaps he was simply human. I ask you to be the judge. What is your verdict? I'm Deb Friedman, and I thank you for joining me.